Thank you. Hi. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name's John Ingold. I'm the narrative director of Inkle, which is a title I gave myself back when it meant not Joe, because Inkle was just two people. But we're now seven, so I actually am a narrative director in that I direct narrative. Uh, so that's who I am. Hopefully you've heard of Inkle because you've played 80 Days in Sorcery, because if you have, you've bought five of our games, which is excellent, and is like a gold star commitment to our company. Um, <laughs> Otherwise, I want to say thank you for coming today to a talk about a game that you haven't played and that you're not allowed to play and that you won't be allowed to play for well, probably about nine months or something. It's quite a long way off. But it now is a really good time for us to talk about the game. So what I want to talk about is why now is a good time to talk about the game, why it's taken us so long to get to a point where we can talk about the game and why I'm really excited about this game and why everyone else in our now gargantuan company is excited about the game as well. So first let me tell you what the game is, because it would be a bit unfair not to. Um, it's called Heaven's Vault, and it is an open-world-ish archaeological science fiction adventure game. The protagonist is Aaliyah El Azra, this lady here, who with her sidekick, the Prim Robot 6, explores the strange space nebula where she lives, tracing lost artefacts, uncovering ruins, translating ancient inscriptions, and trying to understand the lost history of the civilization in which she has found herself. That is the elevator pitch. That's the one line, one sentence exciting summary that hopefully makes you all go, oh, I like that. Uh, one of the reasons why now is a good time to talk about the project is I can now actually do that. About three months ago, and certainly at the time when I agreed to do this talk, I was not actually in a position to do an elevator pitch for Heaven's Vault, despite the fact we've been working on it for about two years, because this one's been a right git to pin down. And a lot of this talk is about why that is. So uh, this, is, this is her, this is six, this is their ship. Um, so uh, I wanted, before I carry on, just to get a quick sense of the room, how many people here are developers. I don't care if you're amateur or if you're Mike Bithell, just sort of in general. Um, and how many people are just players? And how many people don't know where they are? <laughs> oh, that's quite a large number. Okay, alright. Well, never mind. I, I should have written an interactive script with multiple options. <laughs> well, given that you're all basically developers, as the script says, um, you'll recognise this shape. This is our project curve. Um, from where we started. On the top is happy about project, on the bottom is sad about project. <laughs> so, in 2014, in about June 2014, we released a little game called 80 Days, which we'd done as a side project, which we gradually started to feel might actually be quite good, but I thought it was going to bomb because it was way too camp. <laughs> um, which I was wrong about, which was cool. Uh, and Joe and I sat down and we sort of said, okay, well, this is going to give us a platform to do something else, to do something new, to do something bigger, to do something we haven't done before, so what should we do? And we argued. We argued really quite a lot for really quite a long time. Um, but eventually, in about 2015, uh, a year and a bit later, we did make sorcery at the same time, so we weren't just arguing. Um, we had a concept and we liked it and we were about that happy about it and from that concept we ran off and we made an initial design document, a sort of overview of what it would be like and we were super happy about that, that was brilliant, we really liked it, we were very excited. So then we did the natural next thing and we made a prototype and uh, if you are a developer you'll know that your first prototype is always awful. All the things you thought would be exciting simply do what they were supposed to or don't work. But that's okay because you sit down and go, we're good at this, we're professional, we've made a game, it's done well. We will fix our prototype. <laughs> <laughs> and this is entirely true, right? Every, all of you, if you're in the process, should recognise this entirely. Um, so then you say, right, what we need is a deadline to sharpen the mind and to focus ourselves. This state here, this little, this little spoiler, it's a hump, this little hump, here was GDC this year. And we said, let's make a demo and we'll show it to the press behind closed doors. We'll show it to people who will write about it in public what is the worst that can happen. I like to think we discovered what the worst that could happen is, but I won't go into that in too much detail. But, um, so then you enter what, what I like to call the, the climb of sheer faith, in which absolutely nothing gets you through apart from the dogged persistence to carry on doing what you're doing, and you get to your first press demo, and it was okay. It wasn't groundbreaking for us. I don't think we were happy with it internally. It certainly wasn't as good as our original vision of the game, but it was okay. And a lot of the people we showed it to liked it, and that's great. And then you go, right, brilliant. We've seen what people like. We'll take it away. We'll make this better. We'll really nail this thing. We'll go into production. Um, so then what you do, you go, okay, right, everything's going wrong again. 
Let's focus our minds again. We did this, which is the single best thing that we have done, in my opinion. Uh, <laughs> we had a bunch of contractors. We brought them in full time. Suddenly, there were lots of other people who cared about the project for reasons that were completely different than the reasons I cared about the project. And that's a really good motivating force. Uh, we're now about here. Things are actually going well. It's on track, which is why I'm here to talk to you about it. Welcome, everybody. Heaven's Vault's going to be actually quite good. Um, and we're building up towards the final brilliant ultimate goal, which is the day one patch. Um, <laughs> and together, you have to find what I call the mountain of specifics. The million tiny little decisions, every single one of which is terrifying, every single one of which builds on all the other ones you took before, that you never know if they're right, but you have to do them. And actually, that is the bulk of the job. All of this stuff is nonsense, really. That is actually the bit where your game gets made and happens. So, um, I want to tell you about how we got to here, really, because actually there's a whole load of stuff off the back end of this chart, which is me and Joe arguing, which I think is really interesting and tells us a lot about the project. Don't worry, I don't say anything nasty about it, I really don't. Um, so, play the flashback music. Um, let's... Oh, hello, what did that do? <laughs> help. <laughs> no, seriously, help. <laughs> uh, it crashed. <laughs> Two seconds. Mad, right? Uh, John, I've, I've been summoned, but I, I don't know if I can be any help. What's the problem? I, I pressed a cross and it crashed. You know, it's not supposed to crash. Ooh. Oh, I was told it was a PowerPoint. It's I'm a, a PC, I can't help Apple you at all. Phone. Right, here we are. Okay, thank you anyway for coming about it. Make me feel like <laughs> Right, yeah, anyway, so that's, yeah, I work with computers every day. Um, so, flashback music, let's go back to 2014. How did we begin? How do we start making a game? How do we put this sort of thing together? Um, so, we started with a question. It's not a very imaginative question. What game should we make? Well, when we started Inkle, our goal, I guess, was to try and show that we believe that text-based interactive storytelling could be engaging to the average person, not to someone who cares about text games originally and not to someone who even knows necessarily that that's what they are, but they could just be picked up by anyone and played. And we felt, ultimately, with 80 Days, we'd kind of done that. So we wanted to try something else. Um, we wanted to see if we could reach new people, and we wanted to see if we could build on what we've done while still bringing in lots more stuff. And Joe really wanted to do something that was really strongly visual. He's a visual person primarily, not a technical person primarily. So we wanted to bring that in. So we did the natural thing, and we started researching First, we looked at adventure games, and we said, what's good about adventure games? Well, they have a great narrative flow. When they work, they really tell stories. They have great dialogue, great characters. Everybody loves those things. You can explore. That's great. And uh, they're full of interesting things to do, like that thing where you put the newspaper under the door and you poke the key. With the <laughs> Brilliant. Love that. That's great. Um, what are the bad things in adventure games? Well, getting stuck is pretty bad. Like, we accept it as so adventure game players, but I think we're all aware that it is not a particularly nice experience. It has its place, it has its function, but it's not actually pleasant, it's not good. And if I want to bring my game and give it to people who don't normally play games, getting stuck is our number one problem. That's the thing that would make my mum say, I, I, uh, and any audience doing that is not engaging with your work. Um, the second thing is a technical thing, repetitive dialogue. Characters in adventure games almost always give you repetitive dialogue, or they ask you to farm all of their dialogue. That comes from a historical process of it being hard to write dialogue, but that's something I don't like. Um, similarly, locations in most adventure games, you have to farm every location and every corner of location. You cannot afford to miss anything, because if you do, you'll have to go back and get it. That's extremely tedious. And finally, inventories are awful. They're awful. They're a terrible idea. It's a terrible word. It's a terrible concept. Inventories are dreadful, and they should die. <laughs> and we also looked at visual novels, which is sort of the other direction we could go, right, from 80 days and that kind of thing. And we said, well, OK, uh, they're very character focused. That's definitely their big thing. That's why they appeal to who they appeal to. Um, the 2D art usage is really expressive. You get a lot of emotion and character into the way that they do big shots of people. Um, and they're very, very responsive in their branching, usually, sometimes. They can be, because the overheads are quite low. Obviously, all of those points have flip sides. You can't do anything. You just sit there talking to these people the whole time. It's quite an abstract viewpoint. People can buy into it, but they have to choose to do that. It's very difficult to drag people into a visual novel. If they just go, oh, it's just talking heads, you've lost them, they've gone. 
Um, and a lot of the branching is often designed to require replay. Like a lot of visual novels are built on that idea. If you learn the patterns, you play them again, you mine the endings, you hit all 16 of them, and then you're done. Personally, I think requirement of replay as opposed to possibility of replay is a huge difference. Okay. So that's fine. And then we also looked at the, bit, the last express, which I won't go into in too much detail because I talk about it every time I go to talk about it. If you haven't played it, you must. It is ludicrously impossible to play. It's <laughs> absolute genius if you don't know it. It's a, it's a 3D with 2D art game where you explore around a train carriage in real time and the characters are all doing things and it doesn't matter whether you're there or not and they do it and it's responsive and it's beautifully written. It's the best piece of writing in a game ever. It still is. It's at least, what, 20 years old now? Um, yeah, it's fantastic. So we thought, well, we'd do that, basically. Um, <laughs> But it has some problems. Uh, it has quite limited interactivity in its way. There's not that much your protagonist is actually able to do. Um, in particular, you can't talk to people. You can't choose what you say to people, despite being beautifully written. Uh, its way of managing its branching is through harsh, repetitive fail conditions, which is a bit tedious, and why it's pretty much impossible to play. And um, the setting is on a train. So the five carriages on a train with people. That's how it manages to branch as much as it does, that it's got an incredibly constrained setting. The drawback is it's got an incredibly constrained setting. So, but anyway, we thought we'd do that, but not those, and that's what we'd do. Um, so that was great, and that got us to, oh, I don't know, that maybe got us, to, uh, it got us a fair long way anyway. Um, I had a date written down. Oh uh, yeah, it was, you know, this was about June of 2015. We kind of knew what we were doing. We started building an engine and thinking about art and that sort of stuff, and we had a few ideas for setting, but we still didn't know what the game was actually about. We didn't know, um, what, 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 what is this game? Like, you can't just sit down and write, it's going to be like The Last Express, but not. Um, so we had this question, what is the game going to be about? And then Joe went on honeymoon, and I woke up one morning and I had it, I had a vision. I knew what it was, and it was this. <laughs> <laughs> Joe came back from the honeymoon and I said, Joe, sit down, shut up, I've got it, space archaeologist. And Joe said, but you've just been watching a lot of Stargate, haven't you? And I said, yes! <laughs> Stargate. But Stargate isn't actually about archaeology at all, and no one makes games about space archaeology. At least I can't think of any, so let's do that. And Joe said, yeah, sure, whatever. Okay, sounds good. Um, just one problem. So we went off and thought about this. Uh, stories about archaeologists are never about archaeology. My comment about Stargate is not actually glib. It isn't about archaeology. It uses archaeology as a kind of hook, but it doesn't deliver anything archaeological. And there's kind of a good reason for that um, when you look into it. And it's the reason why, when you watch an archaeological documentary, they always talk in poetry voices. They say, this salt cellar once contained salt. <laughs> <laughs> and it's because what they're saying has no significance, it has no meaning, it doesn't matter, it's pointless. But they, want, they don't want you to think that. They want you to think it's important. So they say, look, this is profound. I think it's profound. You should think it's profound, too. But most films, well, there's an ancient super weapon, or they're fighting for eternal life, or some MacGuffin like that, and the film is mostly about people running or fighting. Um, so, you know, this, the Stargate, this is definitely not archaeology. Um, this is Tomb Raider. That is not archaeology. In Tomb Raider, it's always ancient alien super weapons, or at least it used to be. Um, this is Uncharted. It's also not on archaeology. This is usually ancient Buddhist super weapons, which my wife, as a practicing Buddhist, finds most surreal. Um, <laughs> except for Uncharted 4, which is actually a treasure hunt, and the glorious treasure at the end of the treasure hunt turns out to be a big old pile of treasure, which is rubbish, <laughs> actually. Um, this is better. It's still not archaeology, but it's a lot better. And the reason that it's better is in Indiana Jones, the MacGuffin is the actual power of actual God. Always, apart from the second one, which is the one that George Lucas wrote the story for on his own, and we know what happens when he does that. So, <laughs> so the first of the third is actual God. And the reason that that is good is it means that it's actually a film about this guy losing his faith in a world full of evil and then regaining it. So it feels moral and it feels profound and it feels weighty, despite the fact that it's clearly really silly. And that's why when you think about Indiana Jones, in my sort of age, you think, oh, that was really good, I really felt for that guy, and it's because it had a moral core to it. But it's not archaeology, unfortunately. So, um, the core problem is, what is archaeology actually for? And this is a really difficult problem. <laughs> and I, I didn't know the answer, and we couldn't write anything because you need to know the answer. And then I googled interesting archaeologists, or exciting archaeologists, or something like that. And I found this lady, 
um, who is called Dr. Monica Hanna. And she is, she's totally badass, she's brilliant. She's an Egyptian archaeologist who has been, since the Arab Spring, there's been an uprise in looting in Egypt and the ransacking of museums and archaeological sites. And this lady has been leading quite a large team of people um, to try and combat that using publication and cataloguing of, of materials and sites. Um, her actual life story, I've never met her, has been gathered from the bits I can read about her. When she was 14, she snuck into a mummification lab and ended up being part of the team that repaired Thutmose the second's toes. She's been held at gunpoint by tomb robbers. Um, but what really stuck with me was one particular story uh, from her work uh, when she was in the National Museum of Malawi and it had just been looted and she was there cataloguing what was left and she came into a chamber of this museum and there was a youth, it didn't say it was a man but I'm pretty sure it was a man and there was a youth and he was smashing up one of the relics and she said, why are you doing this? and he said, well these things, they belong to the government they don't belong to me, they're not for the people so I'm smashing them because I don't like the government so I'm smashing their stuff and she said, this, what are you talking about? You're Egyptian. This is Egyptian heritage. And the man said, no, no, this is the government. And she had, what she identified was this idea that, that's quite a long quote with a lot of reduction to make it fit, but that the idea of ancient Egypt is utterly removed from the idea of Egypt to most Egyptians right now, and that that's bizarre, and that's something we should fix. And that made me realise, that lit a thing for me in my brain, which was this. Archaeologists are interesting because in our modern scientific world, they are our myth makers. They're the ones who say, I'm going to hypothesise, I'm going to collect evidence, I'm going to disprove, I'm going to counter hypothesise, but ultimately I am not trying to cure cancer. I am trying to cure the void within your soul that says, who am I and why am I here and where do I come from? What they give us are our legends about ancient Rome and King Arthur and whatever else, wherever you come from in the world. But they do it scientifically, which is a way that we, as a thinking nation, though we don't appear to be a thinking nation at the moment, but we used to be a thinking nation, <laughs> cannot refute because it is grounded in science. And this is so relevant. This is so important. This is about who we are. This is about why, in Britain, we still think of ourselves as an imperial, enormous nation that's powerful, even though we're really tiny. This is why we all have a favourite flavour of tea. This is why, if in America, they cannot ban guns, regardless of how many children get shot, because if they do, they'll have to finally admit that the cowboys are gone. And they can't do that because they've got no history in America, and they don't know how to deal with that, and they're reeling from that. That is crazy. It's the equivalent of if we walked around the UK saying, I want to wear a sword at my belt. That is the British equivalent. And you can tell them, right, because when I said that, half of you thought, swords are cool. <laughs> <laughs> swords are not cool. I think they're cool. Why do I think they're cool? Oh, yeah, right, because it's part of my myth. It's part of the myth that is inside my head, that is a ghost that possesses me and walks me around and makes me do things. Like, buy games about knights in armour, despite the fact that I'm basically a cowardly pacifist. Like, why do I do this stuff? Well, because this stuff is deep within me. And archaeologists are fighting that. They're fighting that rhetoric. <coughs> well, they're resolving it anyway, forensically. And that's passionately exciting. That's brilliant. Our game has soul. <coughs> <laughs> I should say, this is definitely not a game about Dr. Monica Hanna. I don't know very much about her work. I've researched what I can. I wouldn't know where to start to make a real game about her. Um, but we were sufficiently inspired when we came to design our protagonist. We wanted to kind of reflect that a little bit, and I hope we've done it respectfully. We did, at one point, put a tweet on Twitter where we showed our art and said this was based on it. And we got a reply from her, which was really great, where she said, and I quote, there are tears in my eyes, which could have so many different <laughs> <laughs> so this is all lovely and exciting and brilliant and wonderful until we start building an engine and making a prototype and really gunning forward and everyone's saying, John, you just get on there and write some scripts and we can test some stuff, but um, <laughs> we haven't actually solved anything because in a game you really need to know, okay, what do, what do archaeologists, what do they actually do? Um, so we read about this, and we did some research on this. They scrub things with toothbrushes. <laughs> they measure small walls. <laughs> they smoke a lot. <laughs> they do build jigsaws and broken pots. I mean, that's a mini game. No, that's not. <laughs> um, every bit of research I did says they also have a lot of sex out in the desert, but I wasn't going to put that on a slide in case this goes up somewhere. So there we go. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, we're in trouble. Uh, but thankfully, they also, and here we started to actually design an actual game as opposed to just sort of spouting rhetorical rubbish with a lot of passion. Um, the first thing they do is they find lost places. They do find places that we didn't know were there. The German businessman Heinrich Schliemann, who is credited with discovering Troy, he probably didn't, he nicked the location of someone else, and he probably didn't find actual Troy, but he's credited with it. And he, the story goes that he read a passage of the Iliad in the original Greek, yes, I suppose so, um, which described them marching on the hill. He marched up the hill, he stuck his spade into the hill, and he said, dig here, and he found Troy. That's the story. Well, okay, this is all nonsense. But somebody did find something at the location which is claimed to be Troy. So in our game, uh, the rivers of space link the moons of the nebula together and you, the player, will be exploring the desert voids between those rivers and finding things. At the top level, it's not a map-based game the way Sorcery was, but a fully open world game, a 3D game. You fly a little ship around and you explore and the dig sites that you locate you find for yourself. You will be an archaeologist locating stuff. We can give you that experience. That is a thing we can actually build. Secondly, when they get to places, they have to work out what those places were and what they were for and what they meant to people. And so one of the ways you can do that is through reading ancient inscriptions, which is a lovely idea for a game mechanic. So we got very excited about that, and that was quite hard to build. Um, in the end, we built an entire alien language based on pictorial symbols, partly inspired by Chinese and the way that that composes symbols together. Um, partly inspired by the way that German builds word Frankensteins for nouns. Um, our original design was to make something that was quite randomly generated so people could replay and sort of solve this puzzle repeatedly. What we found really interestingly was in a situation like this where you're trying to make an inference based on quite um, intuitive logic that a random generator would throw up patterns and connections which weren't supposed to be there that would mislead people hugely and then they'd be resentful about this. So we actually built something which is completely, utterly rigorously logical, but we are not going to tell you the logic at any point. So every connection that you might spot, it has a reason to be there, it has a meaning, it has something that you can infer, but your inferences are your own. And though we give you a limited selection to choose from, because it is a game, and we do have to simulate translation rather than provide translation in the same way that Guitar Hero makes you feel like you can play the guitar when you cannot play the guitar. Um, <laughs> We do like to leave a bit of ambiguity in that translation. I have a question mark because I don't know if it's right. And I may get it confirmed later, and I may never get it confirmed later. And that inherent ambiguity is really interesting to an analysis of the past. So we're quite excited about that and we quite enjoy it. This is the thing that we really built for our GDC little hump. If I remember, I told you we did a press demo and that actually worked and landed and connected with people. Everything else in the game didn't work properly at all, but that bit did, so that was good. Um, yeah, one thing that's really interesting about this as well is that it's obviously a puzzle mechanic. We were quite inspired by The Witness and the way that you go around the world learning the rules of the puzzles as you go. But we wanted to make sure that people didn't need to backtrack. So what the game does internally is it tries to select the best puzzle for you to do next that matches the artifact that you're looking at based on what you happen to know. So there's quite a sophisticated bit of AI underneath deciding exactly what the ancient person wrote on this tablet that you've just found right now. It has to mean the correct thing. We want to be sure that the narrative output of what you find makes sense, but it also has to be within your scope as a player to approach. And so we're sort of triangulating lots of different things. It's a really interesting design problem and occupied it like about seven months of my life. Uh, and the third thing that archaeologists do, and I need to hurry up, um, is they make deductions and inferences. They take bits of evidence, they put it together, and they draw conclusions. Which means that this is not a game about an archaeologist. It's a game about a detective. It's just a detective who's really, really late. <laughs> um, so at this point, we have an engine. We have character designs. We have character names. We have a couple of bits of script. But the design desk is in a bit of trouble because we're going, oh, crap. It's a completely different game. Let's start again. So what do detective games do? Oh, OK, so what do detective games do? Well, detective games have uh, one big problem. In a detective novel, the joy of it is the fact that you, the reader, have no idea what's going on. In a detective game, the one problem is that you, the player, have no idea what's going on. There's a massive conflict at the heart of a detective game that somehow you have to be both puzzled and in control of the solution at the same time. 
And there are lots of ways of solving this. A lot of detective games have a combine the fact mechanic. We didn't go there because we wanted to have a detective character rather than a detective player. We were kind of okay with that. Other things you can do, well, there's the black belt solution. You have puzzles. Some of those are hard. Sometimes the player won't solve them, in which case, bad luck, you're not a detective. <laughs> there's the witcher solution. Just keep repeating everything over and over and over again so that people cannot possibly fail to understand what's going on in your environment. I pick on the witcher, but absolutely every open world RPG does that. Um, there's the heavy rain solution. It doesn't matter if you understand. Just keep pressing the button until you'll get to the end in the end. It probably didn't make any sense anyway. It wasn't really worth it. Um, <laughs> There's the Phoenix Wright solution. Break it into really carefully staged baby steps so that the player can, can really take each step and get from beginning to end. That's a great solution to make people feel like they actually solved it. It does constrain everything down quite a lot, so it wasn't too good for us. There's the, the walking simulator solution, um, which I've called gentleman's agreement. I was trying to find a gender neutral version of that phrase, but I can't think of one. But what I mean by that is, there's some kind of mystery in the world. There's some kind of thing that's happened but the game will never ask you to really demonstrate that you actually understand it. And you, you never have to say anything or prove that you understand it. So there's this sort of gentleman's agreement that you just won't ask and you just won't tell. And you can both pretend that it's okay. And the game can pretend that you understood the plot. And you can pretend that you understood the plot. But actually, neither of you understood the plot. <laughs> For example, I quite often in the office will rant, will rant about Journey, which is a beautiful game that makes no sense at all. And anyone who claims to understand it, well, they're lying. It's a lie. It's, it's beautifully poised, but I don't believe they have a narrative behind it. I, I think it falls under the gentleman's agreement. So, um, so what are we going to do? Well, our idea was to try and um, try and bring bring all these things together and. Instead of making this into a challenge, make this into a feature. So our game is focused around a character who is a detective and who does the inferences for you. But, but you're not out of control of her. This isn't just a cutscene or anything. I'm driving her discovery. I'm making her discoveries. I'm pursuing leads. I'm following lines of interest. And as I gather and find and see information, she'll collect it up and process it for me. So... I don't have to do the deduction, what I have to do is the exploration and the gathering and the being in the world that then allows my detective to do her detectiving. So we're putting a little bit of a distance between the protagonist and the player so that they get to enjoy being in the company of Poirot without actually having to be Poirot. Because Poirot is rarely happy in a Poirot story. Um, and it's quite interesting and I think it plays out quite well. Um, you might be ahead of her sometimes, she might have not quite pieced something together. Or you might be playing catch-up. She might be explaining something that you didn't understand at all. Both of those are actually okay. As long as the writing is good, the plot's good, and you're enjoying yourself. It doesn't matter if you're not completely in lockstep with the protagonist at all times. Um, I think. And the thing which makes this really exciting for me, and which is technically interesting, and which is why I think narratively this game will be good, I hope, um, is that you can approach all of its discoveries and all of its mysteries in basically any order whatsoever, despite the fact that they're all interconnected. Because the whole game is built from little atomic discoveries and little atomic moments, which kind of are preconditioned on each other. So every single line of dialogue in the entire game has a little thing to say, you're not allowed to say this unless you know this thing. And if you don't say this thing, you might discover that thing. And then there's a big bucket of dialogue that just sort of plays itself through. And it can go in different orders, and it can be this way and that way. You should never need to backtrack. You should never get stuck. And yet you're behind every action that the player is taking and every discovery that the player is taking. We had to build everything from the ground up in an atomic way for that to be possible. And that was quite hard, but we've got it now, and it seems to be working. Um, at the heart of this is our idea, we have an idea of knowledge chains, uh, which this is a sort of thing. So uh, you might have a knowledge chain where you've seen the symbol, you've recognised it as an empire symbol, you've seen it on an ancient artefact, and that allows you to deduce, okay, so it's old in the empire, fine. So I might go through that process, da 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 da, -da. At some point I might also wonder whether eagles were real or mythical. Were eagles real creatures? Well, I might wonder that based on finding an ancient artifact and saying, well, these eagles have been around for a while, maybe they were real. But then again, I might just find an eagle skeleton somewhere in an old box, which would hop me straight to there. In fact, it might even hop me straight to here. And the idea is that knowledge chains work independently, but they can feed each other, but they're always moving forwards. Everything I do in the game will find a knowledge chain and push it forward a bit, somehow. 
That's progress. There are about 700 knowledge chains in the game. So you could be working on any one of them at any given time. Some of them will be completely invisible to you, some of them won't. So this is fine. Some knowledge chains are false hypotheses. They're wrong, they're not true, and you can work through them and disprove them. Some of them you will never know whether you're quite right or quite wrong, because again, that ambiguity is important to us. Um, which leaves us with a problem, but it's the kind of problem that we quite enjoy in the company doing what we call as passing off to Joe, which is the UI problem of how do we demonstrate this complexity of facts to the player. Uh, and we do that through this thing, which is gone in like this week, and we're super excited about it. But we did design it a while ago. So at the heart of our game, if you've played Sorcery, you'll notice that the heart of that game is a map. It's really all about moving forward across this map and doing little bits of story as you go. And we added that map mostly because we thought it looked pretty, but it turned out to actually be the whole construction of the game. It let you strategize, it let you say, oh, go here to go there. It let you see that, well, because you went that way, you didn't go that way, so it proved that the game was branching. It really was the soul of the game. And we're kind of thinking that the timeline is going to be the soul of Heaven's Hop. We hope it will. It is our inventory, sadly, if you pick something up, you'll know you did. It's our set of clues, what am I working on, what do I believe at the moment. It's our quest log in our story so far, it'll tell you what you've done and when you did it, so if you put the game down for six months and come back to it, you can literally buzz through the little potted history of what you did. It's all of your translations in progress, so if you're in the middle of one, you can go back to it, you just find it on the timeline and look it up. It's also the law of the game and the background lore and history of the world. This timeline stretches from now to four minutes ago to 20,000 years in the past. And as you play the game, you pop things up and you fill them in on the timeline and you develop those thoughts and they become more detailed. And this is a thing that the player returns to and skim through and scan through and look at and investigate and dig into, but crucially proves that every single thing you pick up you did pick up. If it goes in here, it's because you found it. If you think about it, it's because you found it, and that, that's, this is the proof that it's all real and that sort of stuff. So we're quite excited about that <coughs> and bringing all that together, which leads us where we are now, <coughs> uh, which is just building the goddamn thing, really. Like, we've written most of the script, we've built a few levels, there's a lot more levels, the artists are brilliant, we're a very happy team. It's all really hard. Um, <laughs> thank you very, very much uh, for listening. I hope some of that was interesting. Um, and this is our beautiful cast. And uh, you have a dev blog that we update regularly, which you can follow us on. And uh, yeah, we're on Twitter as well. We want your ship. Um, and I'll take any questions. Thank you for listening. So, do you mean because it's uh, a large scope and we don't know how any of it works properly? Thematically, <laughs> <laughs> because of the idea of the archaeology yeah. side, and mechanically, because that's, that's some sort of new way of interacting with clues and yeah. stories. Yeah, so the question was is it a risky project because it's got a, a, an odd theme and an odd set of mechanics? Is that I accept that. Okay. There aren't um, any guns. Sorry? There aren't any guns. There aren't any guns. Right, there aren't any guns. There isn't any fighting at all. Um, no, I, I said that the other week, and uh, Laura pointed out that someone does get hit by a line of wood at some point. Um, <laughs> yes, it definitely is. And it's taken us a very long time even to get to this point. And the game is definitely not built. I mean, we've been spending real, actual money on this for a while. And that's terrifying and it's exciting, and when the game comes out, when it ships, if it disappears without a trace in the way the games sometimes do, uh, then I think we're going to have to have quite a big rethink about our strategy and our goals. But we did have an opportunity to do something different, and that doesn't come along very often in life, I guess. But I've been writing text adventures since I was about 16. They've had moments of success, but I've never had a moment where I could really sit down and say, what is the, what is the ultimate thing I could build here? Um, I think we all don't want to go live in fear of 80 days being our best remembered game, because if you go out into the world negative, all of that herself, because that's the way it gets reported. And we want something that we did, that was hard, that was worth it. And I don't know if this is that game. It might not be. I suspect the sequel might be this game. <laughs> but, um, 
Yeah, I think it, yes, it is a risk. It's kind of terrifying. But I hope that it's worth taking. I hope we've approached it in a rational way. I feel like I've learned a lot, both thematically and mechanically. So, hey, I, I'm a winner. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're not wrong. <laughs> I appreciated very much your, your comment about the social relevance of myth making um, and how that, that's an active process that archaeologists are engaged in yeah. and that informs us in our lives right now. Um, without knowing the, the, the details of your story, I think if I were imagining how to do what you're doing, I would feel a pressure about having the archaeology mechanic be an excavation of the past of this world always in the context of a present story, yeah. a present drama, something yeah. that's threatening that, that very interesting character. Yeah. Uh, is that, can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the question is, is there a, um, a conflict between the archaeology being, being about the past, but the importance of archaeology being about the present? Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think there are two really important things that I had to realize in order to get any grip on what the hell I was doing writing it. Because a lot of the time I would write a scene and then, oh, we found a pot, we found a sword, and this must be a barracks, and I don't care. And that would happen a lot. And you'd go, ah, oh, crap, there's nothing here. And then you'd wander into, oh, and I found an ancient soup, and then oh, I haven't found an ancient soup. <laughs> um, so we have done two things. The first thing is the game is set in a science fictional context. It's not set in the real world, or even an extrapolation of the real world, despite the fact that these are clearly human beings walking around. That's because in the real world, finding a context where those two things align, the modern pivotal point and the past, is extraordinarily difficult and requires a level of understanding I don't have. I think you could probably do it, but it would be, it would be a masterwork. It would be a, a really delicate balance. And so we decided that was too much. That was too risky for us. So let's take it to a context where we can control everything about the narrative. We can control what the past was and what the future is and make sure that you actually have an interaction. Um, that is cheating, in a sense, but it's necessary, I think. Um, in the same way that detective novels cheat because they're ludicrous, but that's okay. Um, so, uh, otherwise, in terms of the actual plotting of the story, what we've tried to do is make sure that there are, there are narrative detonations built into the history of the world. So this is a world which starts off in quite a constrained place that believes that it understands itself completely. That it, it, um, and I think a lot of us felt this way about the West maybe four years ago. I think now we're all realizing that it wasn't true, which is interesting. And probably, maybe in the long run, I don't know, but like five years ago, I think we would have all said, yeah, we're at the end of history, we've nailed it, civilization sorted. <laughs> Hell, perhaps this is just me talking as a white man, I don't know, in the West, but like, that's certainly a thing that people felt. And, um, and, but actually, if you look at culture, there are lots of detonations, there are lots of realizations waiting for people to have, which change that and turn it on its head and make us realize that we're not as stable as we think we are. There is a lot more of flux the whole time. So our world is built to contain some of those. So that when I discovered this thing 10,000 years ago, it has a real and meaningful impact on the political social structure right now. Um, in the same way that, perhaps in, in a related way to the way that the Egyptian Luta was taking an action, a dangerous action, based on his relationship with his heritage to ancient Egypt, which is an insane reason to go into a museum with a gun. But that's what he did. Um, so, yeah, it's hard. Um, but I like to think we've built the narrative quite carefully to make sure this happens. And I hope we have. And if we have, it should be really cool. And if we haven't, people will go, it's a near miss, which makes it a lot like The Last Express, so I would be happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've got time for one more quick one, if, if there is one. Uh, if there isn't, I should. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I was just wondering about the role of archaeology in your, because obviously, um, in reality, kind of like the modern archive is quite a, a semi recent kind of construct. Um, if you go back, it's more things like the Bone Wars, it's basically glorified looters. Yes. Before. And I was kind of wondering, like, how, um, if, if that kind of, sort of progression is sort of part of how you approached archaeology in this context. So, that progression, not quite so much, but we do have a little bit of the friction between the looter archaeologist and the preserver archaeologist, because that's an interesting um, conflict to explore. I think it's interesting, what was interesting for me was, yeah, when you think about archaeology, you think, wow, archaeologists are cool. Everybody knows archaeology is cool. And then you dig into that and think, well, why is archaeology cool? Well, it's actually going back to something that Jess Haskins said yesterday, that a lot of stories accidentally send the message that colonialism is cool. And that's where archaeology is cool is coming from. 
we think archaeology is cool because we went to countries we had no right to be in, we nicked their best stuff, <laughs> our museum, and says, see, we're top dog now. And that's why we like archaeology, because it's a process of self empowerment for our culture. Great, brilliant. That's a lovely thing to cut into and to start to pull apart. Okay, what's actually cool about archaeology? Well, it's the sense that they were real human beings walking around doing stuff. They were alive, they had thoughts and feelings and complexities and intelligences. They built computers and then some of them did shit. These are real people that we can understand. And separating that out from, this is how archaeology has been used as a propaganda tool. And I think that division, for me, was really interesting. I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but that is an interesting fact nonetheless. Um, so that, the, the looter archaeologist, in my head, appears partly as a thing that I want to make sure that we like, I said this before and I've been criticised for it before, but I don't see the point in telling a story which is safe. As an artist, and I hope I'm an artist, I have to take a risk. Sometimes I will get that wrong, I do have a limited perspective, but I like to be at least aware of where I might be getting it wrong. So, the game might accidentally glorify Heinrich Schliemann, who stole a bunch of stuff from Troy and the rest of the 17-year-old Brian in it. If it does, it's not because I didn't try to stop it from doing that, it's because I, was, I lost control of my train. <laughs> um, but I think that tension provides for a much more interesting storytelling space than not having that tension. So that's why I think that risk is worth taking. Okay, I think I'm done. Thank you very much.